Okay, now I think we are live, but I'm going to repeat this when I think that I'm never quite sure when it exactly goes live. So I think that it now means that we are live right now. So hello everyone and hello the world. Um, uh, my name is Lloyd Russell Moyle. I'm the Member of Parliament for Brighton, Kemptown and Peacehaven, which covers Brighton and Hove Council and Lewis District Council, which is in the wider East Sussex Authority. Um, I am joined with Sim Elliott, who is the coordinator of Craven Vale Food Bank, um, which is one of the active food banks in the local area. And I'm joined by Emily O'Brien, who is here from Lewis District Council, um, where Labour Party, the Green Party and the Lib Dems have a coalition um, to uh, support the work there of the council and control the council. And Emily is the um, lead cabinet member for planning and infrastructure, which basically for this crisis means that she's coordinating a lot of the food distribution issues and some of the other um, infrastructure issues that we have. And many of you may know that uh, about two weeks ago, I was appointed a, a shadow minister in the Department for um, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. I actually don't cover the food and rural affairs portfolio very much. My main bit is the environment, natural habitats, um, uh, the national park and air quality. But I have been privy in the last two weeks to be on some of the calls with all the supermarkets. And every week, the government um, and the opposition that are trying to work together on this, although sometimes that is difficult, uh, has meetings with some of the leading uh, food bank umbrella organisations. And then we have another meeting straight after with some of the supermarkets. And there are some key issues that are being raised about that. And I'll go through just two or three of the key issues that came out of our last call. And then I'll go to Emily, maybe for you to talk about some of the things that are coming out of Lewis and then Sim to talk about what you're experiencing on the ground. One of the key issues that we're still struggling with is some of the vouchers for um, free school meals. Um, and we know this is a problem particularly for claiming those vouchers in non-big supermarkets. So you can't claim them at the co-op, you can't claim them from smaller, from smaller shops. In many of our estates, we know the nearest shop for you to be able to get to, to walk, um, is of course the co-op or is a, um, a Londis or is a Happy Shopper or Premier or something like this and at the moment you can't use those food vouchers for that and that is something uh, because the government has decided uh, that they're um, that those small shops are too complicated to claim the money back from it's easier for them to do it for Asda and Tesco's because it's one company the co-op is lots of little companies uh, and so is uh, Londis and, and, and Premier and all those other little shops. Um, and so we are working through on that, uh, but we're worried that what that means is for some people getting access to food uh, through those food vouchers is more difficult. We also know that there's a particular difficulty still in some of the deliveries. Now the supermarkets have all been given the list of people who have been told to shield but there are many people for other reasons that might not be able to go out. If you're self-isolating, if, um, if you're trying to protect another loved one, et cetera. Um, and there are issues of people who are working and the shops are now um, only open for shortened hours. And so there's some issues around there that the supermarkets and us are trying to work through. Most of the supermarkets that we've spoken to say that they are at absolute capacity for home delivery. They've got no room for expanding at the moment. Asda told us that the amount that they had expanded by was the amount that they had planned to expand over the next five years. And they've done it in this short time. They've bought extra fleet and they've tried to expand. But we can't expect much more room from there. So what's key is trying to direct people to the right uh, available food source. And if people can get out, to actually make sure they do go out to shop rather than using the delivery routes which need to be prioritized for people who really can't either because maybe you're a key worker and you're just um uh, or mainly because you're shielding or self-isolating and then we've got an issue of course about trying to make sure that we feed people who have lost maybe income that they had previously expected and this is where we see a huge rise in food banks and the difficulty there um i know in whitehawk on this this weekend we ran out of um, or not, not ran out, but we had a shortage of tinned food. 
um, particularly tin vegetables. So the idea of how do we get those things to the right place at the right time. And then we have this perverse situation that people might want to ask in the questions. Of, at the moment, we are throwing milk away in this country because bizarrely, you might not realize this, we're actually drinking far less milk than we normally do. All those lattes that you normally have that are 50% milk, you have two lattes, that's probably half a pint gone already. People aren't drinking them. This means the milk market has dropped out, uh, of, uh, the bottom has dropped out, and a number of farmers are throwing the milk away down the drains. And so we're desperately trying to find a way of preserving that so we don't waste food during this period as well. And that includes drying some of that, turning it into UHT or cheese, or encouraging farmers to divert production to things that we need and have shortages with. So that's a summary of the key things that came up um, uh, came up uh, in our discussion. There is a bigger discussion about how we're going to pick the vegetables and fruit um, and stuff when the harvest comes along. And there's been some discussion about whether we create a land army of volunteers to go out and do it. Well, you would need lots of people to do that because they are unskilled, untrained people or whether we try and get people who are skilled and trained to come very regularly, but often aren't residents in Britain. And there's a balance there that needs to be struck. And I think that that's a discussion that we're gonna to have to have uh, ongoing. That's some of the bigger, big picture stuff that, um, that some of the supermarkets and some of the ministry has been uh, considering. And with the Ministry of Defense, there's been this, uh, DEFRA have been coordinating these food parcels uh, and local government have been in charge of trying to make sure that they are also coordinated to be delivered. I don't know, Emily, if you want to talk about what Lewis District has been doing to try and make sure some of those people on the shielding list are getting their food, but also some of those other people that might be very vulnerable but haven't quite yet fitted into the shielding list but need to receive certain food parcels because they can't get out of their home at this time. Yes, thanks, Lloyd. Yeah, I'm. Well, and we can't I'm... hear you at the moment, Emily. Oh. Actually, I think that's just me. I can, go now. I can hear you. Okay. okay, great. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Emily O'Brien. I'm a councillor and cabinet member in Lewis District Council. Um, one of the main responses we've had, well, there's a couple of main things that we've done as a council, although I, I could comment on some of the issues and absolutely agree with what you're saying about supermarkets needing to step up here. Um, supermarkets have done well from this crisis and we do need more of the slots. I'm happy to talk about that later. But um, what we've done as a council is to set up a community hub, which is um, a kind of helpline and online registration form for people who are in need of support to get in touch. So it has been quite a little bit confused what people need to do. I know people have been, um, if they're clinically extremely vulnerable, their GPs might have registered and they might have registered themselves. But as you said, many people fall outside that bracket. Um, and there, um, anybody who needs support, whether that's with um, shopping or with um, accessing food because they can't afford food, or whether it's because they need to access some company or help just getting medicines, is welcome to ring that number. And, and people should have had through their letterbox, or they will be getting in the next few days, anyone in Lewis District, a reminder of that phone number. Um, and the way that the community hub works is it can signpost people for help. Um, and that's mainly through local groups. So some of that's our established groups, our established food banks, um, befriending organisations. Um, but also there's a lot of new groups have sprung up. You know, there's so many COVID-19 mutual aid groups. So we're working with around 60 groups at the minute and signposting between them and passing people on. And at the same time, the other main thing we've done is to kind of ensure that there is enough food in our system for those people to get fed in this time. Um, one of the things we're seeing is, is um, people who could potentially sort themselves out for food, whether they're the shielded group or just vulnerable for other reasons, but they're not necessarily able to access delivery slots. So they're requiring emergency food for that. And that's one of the things that we've been raising nationally like yourselves and really would like to see change because we're really worried about the scale of need out there. Um, and we're seeing a big increase in demand for emergency food. And one of the things that um, you know, we're concerned is that the community response could be overwhelmed. 
But in the meantime, we have brought in a lot of food. Um, we've packed up and distributed around 800 food parcels um, to food banks to support their efforts, along with other food as well. We've redeployed some of our staff, so people who would have normally been operate, working in you know, other roles that aren't open anymore, they're now busy packing up food. It's often in really big tins, so you know the kind of catering type food, because it's, it's, nobody can get supermarket type food, it's been short, so we're using some of the catering type food, really massive tins. Not always perfect what you'd want, but people have been really, really grateful for it. Um, and we're de de delivering those to organisations and also to individuals if, if there isn't a suitable organisation and playing a big role around making sure those groups are all talking to each other as well. So we have weekly Zoom calls and a WhatsApp group to put all those groups in touch with each other. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Emily. It was interesting you were talking about the catering supply food there. One of the things that, again, people don't realise necessarily is that a lot of companies will only supply to catering suppliers and changing suddenly to domestic supply is actually a process that can't happen straight away. So how we manage that and Lewis District actually process of doing some of that is one of the things that we raised um, on the ministry call. I mentioned Lewis District particularly actually uh, because a lot of councils haven't been doing that and they've been saying they've been struggling to get hold of food and so that is something that now the government will look at advising all councils to do, to be able to use those resources, because we want to keep the catering supply lines open as well. We don't want those catering companies to end up going to the wall and then when things reopen, also have a problem with some of those supply lines. So that is really important to try and keep doing that. And I think that's really good that Lewis District has done it's also really important that we're signposting to local shops as well, because sometimes even if we can't get the supermarket slots, as local shops are able to. And one of the things we've done is put on the Visit Lewis website a list of all the kind of, you know, as many as we can of the kind of pubs and restaurants um, and organisations that are now delivering. Um, because, again, it's really, really important for our response as well. We are actually not going to be able to cope with helping all the people who need help if we don't let those who have money find routes to spend their money and support our food economy, which long term, you know, we really have to think about how we support that going forward as well, how we help those businesses to change and adapt and how, in a sense, we don't really want to go back to business as usual. What this crisis has done is shown how broken many things in our food system are. And we'd really like to be part of finding a new way forward around that. It was interesting, I thought, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come on to Sim in a second. I thought it was really interesting how you, generally smaller shops were able to continue their supply lines when people were panic buying stuff. And there was a number of reasons for that. What, but in terms of food resilience, clearly they were more able and more nimble to source suppliers. But the second part of that is that engaging with your local shop with a local person that you look in the whites of the eye of and you know because you regularly go in there or you know because they live around the corner from you, actually developed more social responsibility for what people were doing and buying when people were starting to panic. And I think there is something about having to build that social responsibility back in to food and how we buy things. And if we're really gonna tackle some of these big great issues that are coming forward like climate change and, 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 and needing to, create more resilient communities that surely is a way forward absolutely I mean between I'm a, obviously as a green councillor and someone who works in food and food poverty and food issues anyway that is my life um, I absolutely think that food is such an important part of climate change and it has been a little bit on the back foot but this crisis has really brought that to the front I mean between a fifth and a third of our individual carbon footprint is based depending which figures you look at is based on the food we eat so if we don't address that, we're missing a trick, frankly. So I'm hoping that we can, you know, look into the future when we get past the immediate crisis, we're able to do something really amazing around seeing food as part of the solution and food employers as part of the solution. I mean, so many people who even before this crisis, so many of the people experiencing food poverty worked in the food industry, whether that's around farming or catering or, you know, supermarkets people have been underpaid in that sector and it's not been valued. So, you know, I, I think the fact we've all been able to change our habits, we've got used to getting deliveries, we've started to buy direct from suppliers, veg boxes are completely sold out, those kinds of things. I'm hoping that that could help to, to you know, in a small way, bring about some changes going forward. Yeah, 
No, fantastic. And I think that um, building those local communities, as well as building um, uh, better, better engagement uh, um, in terms of food banks and shops, is one of the things that you've been working on at SIM. I mean, Craven Vale is a small little area um, of, of, um, of, of a set of council um, and social housing that was built well, probably in the 40s, maybe I'm right, um, right next to an area that is a relatively affluent area, but has a mixture of very nice houses, including houses of multiple occupancy and flats that have been turned in. It's not a huge area in the city, but it has a real mix of, of people. And your local food bank has really stepped up to be able to serve those people. What are those issues that you're seeing in that real mix of area of people who might never have been on benefits or received yeah. support who might yeah. be coming to you, as well as people who also having to support the, the, the regular users in the area? Um, I, mean, I think it's a, a, a dramatic change for a small independent food bank. Um, I'll give you a bit of the context of that. We serve the Braden Vale estate, which is exactly as you described. We also serve Bankhurst estate, which is another small council estate mm -hmm. in Brighton. Um, I think the first thing to say is that there was a huge amount of food poverty within that social housing already. Um, as a result of the impact of the casualisation of work, people on very precarious work, zero hours contracts, people were already experiencing food poverty. Um, and also the issue of universal credit rollout. Um, people can't access universal credit quickly, so in food poverty for that time. But another really significant factor is that even if you're on universal credit, the cost of housing in Brighton is so enormous that you can be in food poverty even with all the benefits that you're technically uh, entitled to. I think one of the huge impacts, uh, well, the impact of coronavirus was colossal and immediate. In the space of um, uh, uh, three weeks, we had a threefold increase in referrals. It was enormous. Four weeks ago, we had about 20 to 30 people coming into the food bank, collecting a food parcel, self-selecting what they needed. Um, last Friday, we delivered food to 127 people in 69 households. That's 85 adults and 42 children. I mean, that's a colossal increase. And there was that presented itself with a whole number of significant logistical issues. First is people. We don't have any staff. Um, we are just volunteers who work within the community association. So we're not like a, a trust, trust a food bank that is just a food bank. We have a, a food bank that runs typically on a Friday for a couple of hours. We've had to go to a delivery um, system because obviously people can't come into a food bank because of the social distancing, which means to the start we had to recruit a very large number of new volunteers. Um, one of the positive sides of, of this uh, terrible crisis is that it's, it's there's been an outpouring of, of, of sort of community love um, and a real sense of mutuality. People want to help each other, whether they know someone or not. They just want to get out and do something, which has been amazing. I think the biggest issue, aside from the number of referrals, so the actual demand, is supply. Food banks, most food banks can't serve or store chilled food. So we need ambient food, room temperature food. Well, room temperature food means tins and long life food. Those were the first things that went from shops. The majority of food bank supplies in the past were made by Fair Share, the national charity which redistributes overstocked and reclaimed food. But there wasn't really very many overstock tins within a couple of weeks. So in fact, we had to supplement uh, our procurement of food by going to wholesalers, going to supermarkets and buying food. We have no funding for that. Fair share we could fund by asking food bank users to contribute 50p for a bag of food. Within the first week of the crisis, we had bought six, just over £600 worth of food in a week. The second week, we bought over £800. Last week, we bought 
1500 pounds of additional food to meet the need because whilst fair share is a brilliant organization we couldn't guarantee that we'd get the non-perishable goods that we would supply now typically food banks give pop-up bags which is a roughly three-day supply of food because we assume that people can access food elsewhere that's not true for a lot of our, our, our users now we've got people in absolute poverty um I'm, someone phoned me for a self-referral um, on Friday saying my universal credit comes in on the 30th until then I have 37 pence so a top-up bag isn't going to be enough for him someone came to the food bank which technically they shouldn't have done because we're doing deliveries but didn't have how else to contact and just said I haven't eaten for three days I need food and I sort of need it now that's the reality of that and that in demand has come from people on precarious work losing their jobs entirely or having their hours massively reduced or they're being furloughed but they're not actually accessing for some reason they're in employment where they're not accessing that money there's a lot of self-employed people who have never big earners people like hairdressers who are on a low income and self-employed they don't have any money it's just completely gone the other impact was the number of uh children i mean in the east brighton area where our food bank is based when you add in housing costs, 44% of children live in child poverty. So um, if you imagine the number of children that those were receiving one of their main meals through free school meals, all of a sudden that stopped because those children were in school. So those were dramatic increases. So the difficulty for a very small independent food bank is you need to uh, cater for a huge number of um, new referrals, be able to actually have the staffing, the people power to do it, and then secure the food. I mean, we're very lucky in Brighton Hope because we're part of the Independent Food Network and the council and the Brighton Food Partnership, which um, uh, facilitates the Independent Food Network, have amazingly stepped in. We've got a uh, Hungry at Home Fund, the council has contributed to that, so we're now able to access um, uh, additional food supplies from the food partnership and funded by crowdsourcing and the council. The amount of donations from just ordinary members of the community has grown uh, immensely. So there's a huge effort, but actually every week we're still going to need to buy food where we didn't do that before. So we've had to go for crowdfunding, we've had some very generous donations from council award budgets, um, uh, the local... I saw, I saw, Sim, that there was one, I know, and I'm sure a lot of political parties are doing this, but I know the local Labour Party members who can afford paying a bit extra every month. That's right, that's fund. right. Yeah, our, our branch... One of, the, one of the members went down and spent that uh, all at ASDA, and, <laughs> yeah. and snapped them and said, "That's right." Man hoarding pot noodles, and the yeah, yeah. came out. The man was actually buying um, huge amounts. Of it wasn't noodles. all pot noodles either. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're very lucky. The local Labour parties here, branch parties, because we we are in East Brighton, but we serve two wards. Uh, the parties have established a solidarity fund where members put in money, and that's being split between all the emergency food provision in the two wards. Yeah. So we've got because you're you're covering actually three wards. That's right. <laughs> Labour and Green councillors. So we've that's got right. East Brighton, which is all Labour. You've got which is Craven Vale, Baker's Bottom Park, which is two right. Labour, one Green, and the Pancake yeah. State, which is three Labour. Yeah, uh, three yeah. Green, sorry, three Green. So you've yeah. got a, a neat a mixture <laughs> there, um, and and hopefully they're all they're all chipping in. Look, I've got some questions mm. that we might be able to do. Um, uh, so the first question, um, which I suspect it might have a slightly different answer for Lewis and yeah. for for the Brighton area, um, is from Carmel, and she says she wants to donate food. Or donate to a food bank mm. what is the best type of food to donate and where can she drop it off how okay. can she contribute so if i was in a brighton sim how would okay. i do that do i deliver it directly to you or is there a centralized coordination for food bank deliveries the the best thing to do for food bank donations is to look on the 
Brian and Hove uh, Food Partnership website, go to the how to refer to a food bank and it lists all of the food banks in Brighton so you can phone them up and make direct deliveries. Mm -hmm. The important thing is unless a food bank has cold storage, which many don't, um, dropping off vegetables that are going to perish is only really useful if you do it a day before or uh, on the day of uh, distribution because all food banks now have gone to deliveries. We can't store any chilled items. So things like milk, um, cheese, unfortunately, we can't accept. The best things are by far are tins or non-perishable foodstuffs that uh, people in food poverty can use as and when they, they need. Um, tins of uh, fish, tins of meat are good, uh, tins of vegetables, tins of fruit, pasta, rice, noodles, Bread, if bread is really important, if you can get it uh, while it's fresh into the food bank. Okay, perfect. And Emily, in Lewis District, is there the same, is there the same coordination portal or is it more town by town? Yeah, it's a similar answer, really. Um, so obviously we want to avoid unnecessary journeys in the current mm. climate. So one of the best things is to, do, is to make a connection with a local food bank or local COVID-19 group. Um, and we do list the main food banks on the Lewis District Council website. So if you go to the front page, there's a quite helpful set of resources, which also includes if you want to volunteer as well, there's an option around registering to volunteer because sometimes people want to give their labour rather than their food mm. and are able to help in that way. So if you, um, so again, you can either contact a local group and offer your services direct um, or you can do it through the website. Um, but we wouldn't tend, we wouldn't probably take individual donations. It's better if you can find your local group to donate to. Um, and we do, as I said, have a bit of a listing of those on the website. If you live in if you live in Telscombe or East Saltine, you can drop mm. them off at the Civic Centre. So there's a there's a place to drop off there. And I think they get collected by fair share fortnightly or, or weekly. But that then I think gets distributed to a wider area so it, I if you want, said that, yeah. 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 You want to yeah. know that it's going to your local food bank you've got to make contact with them but there yeah. are drop-off points like at the civic center and a number of supermarkets where you can you can drop off yeah off and most of the supermarkets still have their donations kind mm -hmm. of you know many of the supermarkets they have a little trolley mm -hmm. or somewhere you can donate and many of those are still um, working. Um, it also might be worth mentioning, particularly thinking of um, Sims area as well, um, but, it do, um, but it would also be relevant for the bit of Lewis that's, that we're talking about as well, the bottom bit of Lewis, is that if, you, if, you, if you're a company with like a large amount to donate, mm. and we are seeing quite a lot of that, you know, businesses that have had to cease, they might have quite big amounts of surplus food, they can um, contact an organisation like Fair Share Direct or they can also yep. go on the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership website and that will then get that call will then go out to organisations who can distribute those larger amounts. So I know there's quite a few businesses that have been incredibly generous and mm -hmm. it's been really welcomed. Um, and that that although it's the Brighton and Hove Food Partnership website, it will cover the areas up to as far as New Haven as well. So. No, that's that's really good as well. And you're right about also the mutual aid groups, although that's less about donating and more about matching people up. Um, if in Brighton, there's mutual Brighton mutual aid.co.uk website you can go to, and then it lists all the mutual aid groups in Brighton. There's a map there you can locate where you are. Um, I've joined all of them, so I see what's happening and bubbling under the surface, or someone in my office has a look at that. And they are more for linking people up. So if you have some food and you sometimes see that people saying I've cooked extra food is there anyone that needs it or more often it's people saying I need something. Can someone help me get this because I can't leave my house today or tomorrow. They don't necessarily need help from a food bank or from a um, from a council regularly, but they just need a one off piece of help. And it's important if you can organize yourself, I guess via mutual aid to try and do that so you then don't overburden the council or the food bank because if everyone goes to the council or food bank then we won't be reaching the people we need to. I've got a, que yeah. I've got a question from uh, Ben. Um, he says, how is the government expecting shielded persons to survive on SSP, statutory sick pay, which is the same now as the universal credit, it's been, universal credit's been lifted up, it's just over 90 pounds a week. 
um, for the maximum of 12 weeks that we're being shielded for? Now, that's a very good question. How are you meant to survive? Now, Lewis District um, is, the, is, the, um, is one of the people that helps support some of that uh, benefit, particularly the housing benefit. There's some support that Lewis District can offer there. And there's also some support via some other discretionary means. Are there particular adaptions that you've had to make there in terms of the COVID crisis, Emily? Um, yeah, I would, I would encourage people to contact, to again, look at the website. So there is a council tax reduction scheme and we had actually just recently um, before the crisis, but it's been really timely. We had actually um, slight widened that scheme to be more helpful to people who were self-employed, who were previously quite excluded by that scheme and are now included. So people on a very low income, um, but self-employed. So it was, it's, it's, it's quite a complicated scheme to explain, but there's a simple form that can be filled in on that website which is also for housing benefit as well. Obviously, again, housing benefits really complicated in our current world of universal credit, but there are some people who can get housing benefit. And we would encourage you to fill in that form. It's, it's the, you know, look at the website, do the form. That's the best way to access it really. Um, and there's also the website's the best place to go for business support information as well. There's a number of ways in which, again, it's, it's complex, um, yeah. but, um, and we would say, you know, if, if you're looking at it and you're just, bemused um, you know to get in touch particularly one of the ways that we're encouraging people to get in, in touch and it's seen a huge increase is to go on the website and then use the web chat function and that's a really good way to speak to an advisor without using up the phone line for those people who really really need that telephone mm -hmm. support. Um, I, must have, I used that the other day Emily at Lewis District because we had some problems about um, catheters being collected. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which I hope that we, we're on, on the course of resolving now. But I used it and I found it extremely useful actually. You know, usually I'm a bit skeptical about these automated uh, mm. chat boxes, but I got the manager, the person that I needed to speak to. And, and so people shouldn't be afraid of using those things if they can, uh, even if they've not done it before. But I, I was very impressed by the, the speed of the response from Lewis on that. Great. And it, it does really help us if people can use online if they can, because obviously, like everyone, we've got a lot of our staff working at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of demand on our phone lines. And if you can go online, we can generally answer your question more quickly. And, you know, whether it's the web chat or using a, an email or a web form. But it does mean we can leave the helpline open for those who lack mm -hmm. Internet access. And they are one of the biggest group of people that we're trying to support at the minute is the people who aren't digitally literate, who can't get yeah. online deliveries, who can't use Amazon, can't use the, the supermarket deliveries if they can get them. Um, it, would it be a good moment? Is it possible just to give the phone line out for no, anybody? Really in useful. Give the phone, phone so, as I said, if you can use online, go to the website, use online. But if you can't, then it's 01273 099956. So that's 01273 09956. Perfect, that's good. Look, I've got another question here from Mary Jane. Um, she says, with so many people now relying on food banks, it's difficult to see how we get out of this situation. What do people think is going to be the answer to such over-reliance on food banks coming out of this? Now, this is an area that I'm, how we move out of the crisis, I think is as much of an issue that we need to be thinking mm -hmm. about now um, as some of the other issues, because different sectors and different parts of the country, particularly in parts of the country that rely on tourism or hospitality, will suffer for much longer than maybe other places that have a more manufacturing base where people can go back mm. to factories mm. and start working. Sim, is there any thinking locally, your local food bank, about how you support people going forward and try to actually, um, I mean, we don't want a reliance on food right. banks in the end. I think it's a really complex issue because I think we have to acknowledge there's a food poverty crisis that existed before COVID. Mm -hmm. So even when the COVID crisis ends, there's still going to be a lot of people in food poverty. So there needs to be systemic structural changes to address that. In terms of people who are using food banks now, um, I think what we're trying to do is identify people who need all of their uh, week shopping as opposed to people who need a top up and supplement that with a shopper. So what we've gone into, as well as delivering food, pairing people up with shoppers so that people can continue having some autonomy, getting the food that they can afford, and then we top that up. Because what we don't want people to do 
it's just become reliant on delivering food. In the long term future, I think this brings in the whole uh, huge question about the universal credit system. I think it's broken. I think it, the, the delay in getting it out and then the fact that when you get it, you're still in poverty. My personal belief is I think we need to move to a universal basic income because actually a lot of the things that have happened in the last few weeks, if everyone was getting a universal basic income, wouldn't have happened. You would still have had the people who can't get out and you would have had to address how they access food with their money. But a lot of people just haven't got the money to do it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Emily, have you got any thoughts about how we move out? I mean, we talked about this a bit earlier on, didn't we, about trying to make sure some of those positive things around food resilience come out of it, but particularly about this reliance on food banks. You know, you, you see this, you, you see, not to be too party political, but I think we can be a little bit here. You, 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 you see Tories going and cutting ribbons to local food banks in the press and saying how delighted they are the food banks opened up. And I always feel so uneasy about that. Yeah, yeah, it Because at one point you're kind of saying, well, it's an absolute disgrace. <laughs> This has yeah. to exist, but it's absolutely amazing people are doing the volunteering and the hard work yeah. to protect our communities and our vulnerable people. Yeah. But how do we move to a situation where we're seeing food banks shut down because there's not enough need rather than shut down because there's not enough food? I mean, I think what's tricky here is the scale of need, yeah. which is going to increase as we are all starting to tail off as councils, for instance, our our interim response, we shouldn't be emergency food providers long term, mm. that is not our role, and we can't afford it. We've already spent over £60,000 on emergency food, we're talking, and that's to prop up donated food. So one of the very first things in relation to the scale that food banks told us is that food banks aren't going to be the answer here, which is why we've stepped in to support that response. But we've got to be honest here and say, actually, do you know what? Food banks were never the answer here no, and they sure. never should be the answer. And what yeah. we don't want to see is a return to business as usual yeah. when that business as usual involves a lot of people reliant on food banks. Yeah. And I really hope that if there's any learning from the amazing community response here that we've seen, the kind of sudden value people have placed on our food supply chains that have always yeah. been, you know, we've just got really used to taking for granted. Yeah. I really hope that there is an opportunity to build on that. No, I, I, I hope so too, really. And, and I think we, we, have to, we do have to look about how poverty in Britain is really tackled mm. at the moment. I, I mean, I'm a great supporter, as, as, as you know, Sim, of a form of universal uh, basic income. I mean, I think universal basic income is not a panacea and you still need a level of targeted support, whether that be um, for disability purposes, whether that be for respecting particular housing needs and housing costs. But generally, the idea, I'm a universalist at heart, mm. I like to try and give everything to mm. everyone according to their need. So it doesn't mm. mean that ev everyone gets exactly the same thing, but everyone gets access to the NHS. Not mm. everyone gets a plaster cast on their leg, depending on your need. Yes. But everyone does have access to it. Um, and then what you do is we pay it back via taxes. And actually, it would have been far simpler and quicker for the government to have done that, to have said we're going to give £2,000 yeah. to everyone. And don't worry, those of you who are still earning, you're going to pay it yeah. back anyway next year because we'll adjust the tax ban slightly and right. you'll, you'll pay it back anyway. They didn't decide to do that. And I suspect universal basic income for the immediate crisis is now no longer on the table. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no point in flogging a dead horse. But there is the possibility of looking at a universal basic income or what Spain is talking about, which is a basic, uh, a basic income floor. So mm. it says that there must be a basic that everyone needs to receive mm. and that could be calculated on a, on a basic of, of, of need of living rather than just this arbitrary universal credit. Because yeah. going back to Ben's point, statutory sick pay, universal credit, all of that myriad of benefits, not only does it take too long for them to get, but actually they're just unlivable on. Mm. And one of the positives that might come out of this is that you have a lot more people who suddenly are aware about the awful treatment that we yeah. have given people who are on benefits in this country yeah. for many, many years. And rather than um, wanting a race to the bottom on these things, rather than pushing more people into poverty and food poverty, mm. it might be an opportunity 
for us to say, let's redo a new social contract mm, mm. with the state and the people. And of course, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, the social contract works both ways. <laughs> there are rights and responsibilities, but a new social contract can really um, found a, a place where food poverty is something of the past. Yeah. Um, and food banks convert from having to donate food because of food hunger to great resources of um, how to cook yeah. and use food. Yeah. And you start to yeah. see that in different places where yeah. Yeah. it's not just about money with food poverty, it's also about knowledge of yeah. food and confidence with food. And that's then the, what we need to tackle. But there's no point in tackling that if you don't also don't get at least food for people yeah. uh, to start with. Look, this has been an interesting discussion. We usually try and go on for about half an hour, for, uh, 45 minutes, which, uh, 40 minutes, which we have done now. Um, so I'm going to uh, going to wrap up and say thank you very much for coming. Is there anything, Sim or Emily, that you think hasn't been said that we probably need to cover for people? Um, I think just to say, you know, be aware we are there to help. Look on our website if you're in need of help. Um, I think one of the things we're seeing is people who are in need of help sometimes don't want to come forward they they're aware help is there but they think it's yeah. not for them. and particularly i think what one of the things we're seeing is a ramping up in people's isolation um yeah. and it's very difficult when you're indoors um mm. sometimes you know to to kind of to admit that that can be an issue so i think i suppose one of the things is food and company often go together don't they we bring people together yeah. over food we have feasts at weddings we have food at funerals i think there's something around the fact we're not eating together and eating with our families that is also contributing to that isolation so yes. i bring those two things together and say you know don't be afraid to get in touch even if you even if it's not about the food it's about the company let us put you in touch with someone around that. Um, and I suppose I'd also set, you know, echo your view, Lloyd, around saying it's really important that we don't just go back to business as usual. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a Green, obviously, we've had universal mm -hmm. basic income on our agenda since <laughs> you didn't even know what it was. But this is beyond this situation is beyond any party politics. Yeah. We need everyone to be on board with those kinds of solutions and absolutely working cross party at the minute as it should be. What party you come mm -hmm. from, mate no difference we've all got to work together to to fix yeah. this i mean I, I could try and defend and say that some of gordon brown's um introduction of uh, uh tax credits was an attempt to start to rebalance the state so the poorest were starting to get things back from the state and it was a transition moment that we could have used that but of course 2010 we all know what happened we lost power and that momentum to start changing the way that the state redistributed money uh, change. That's maybe a generous uh, playing of, 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 of that, but we can we can leave it there. Is there anything similar? Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, in Brighton, I think I'd just like to say that Brighton Council has got an excellent um, web page where you can refer for help or refer yourself or anyone else. So just Google um, ask for help Brighton Hove Council and you'll get to the right place. Then you'll be referred on to a community food bank or um, some form of mutual aid or if you have emotional, uh, psychological difficulties about the crisis, you can be signposted on. Picking up on Emily's point, one of the things that we're picking up a lot, we serve a, a, an estate with a very large number of older people who have no internet access, who are either shielding or self-isolating, and they're anxious, they're frightened, they're getting quite depressed. With our shopping volunteers, one of the things that we've noticed is just having regular contact you start off talking about what you need at the shop and end up being a bit of a chat. And I think there's a huge need for that. There's organisations like Together Co in Brighton, which are facilitating um, be telephone befriending. Um, they're looking for volunteers at the moment. I think maintaining the mental health of the nation is really as, as important as uh, maintaining their physical health and their food needs at the moment. Fantastic. Look, thank you very much, uh, Sim. Um, thank you, everyone, that has um, uh, joined in on this uh, this call. Um, look, the main thing that I would always say is make sure that if you are struggling, you reach out. You reach out, whether it be to your neighbour or whether it be to your friend, um, whether it be to the council or the food banks that we've heard. No one needs to suffer in silence, whether it is for 
food purposes or whether it is just in loneliness purposes. And there are things you can do together. Me and my neighbours had dinner in our doorways the other day so that we could still chat to each other um, across the road. There are things that you can do that are creative if you need to, but there are also people to help if those things are not possible and they're not for everyone. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much, Sim. And well, thank you. <laughs> thanks. And we will try and do again another one next week um, on a different topic. Uh, and hopefully we will get your comments back. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.